Thank you, Jessica. And thanks to Meredith and the panelists for sharing about your engaging BMPEC team models. Next up, we have Maria Ballesteros Sola from Cal State Channel Island. She serves as our B Academic Chair of Membership, and she's going to be leading a session on teaching with case studies. So, Maria, please take it away for us. Thank you, and um, of course, thank you for the invitation to discuss cases. This is one of my passion, and I want to present a model in which experiential learning and cases are not seen as enemies, but complementary. So the agenda that I put together for the next 45 minutes is really to do a, a quick intro uh, and explain what is a case, why this is important, and how do we go about teaching cases in our classes. But I want to spend the second part really discussing an exciting project that the academics is also spearheading. Uh, we call it the Social Impact Cases Repository. And of course, going into the details of what B Corp cases are available uh, right now. And I do feel that they are getting a lot of momentous as a reviewer for different case journals. And I'm getting a lot of B Corp cases uh, lately. The focus is on teaching, but I also want to just drop a few you know, ideas about those of you that say, oh, I have all these great connections with B Corps. I really want to write a case. How do I get it started? So I'll, I'll get that to the end. And just a little bit to let you know about my engagement with the case uh, writing community, and just to put a few names out there, because my call for action at the end is going to really um, suggest that you find your case uh, writing tribe. So there are a few organizations and the primary focus is to write cases and develop uh, uh, academics as case writers. So North America Case Writing Association is one of them. I am the track for the Social Impact and Sustainability Chair. We actually closed the call for cases on Monday, but if you have a case that you think is really, really uh, ready to be submitted to a conference and you, you miss the deadline, please uh, write me and I'm sure I can make it work to let you in. It is a great conference. We sit in a round table and we spend uh, a couple of hours talking about just three, four cases. So everyone give you a lot of good feedback. There is a fantastic foundation called the Case Research Foundation, started by the daughter of Paul R. Lawrence. This was a Harvard professor that did a lot for cases. So again, if you are either a PhD student or junior faculty that want to explore this world, I invite you to uh, apply for the fellowship. It's, I got in 2016, and this is how I got into this NACRA world. Um, there is a wine kid research journal uh, run by Sonoma University. I sit in that editorial board. Uh, Emerald has a fantastic emerging market collection. I also sit in that board and then with the American uh, University in Cairo, um, they have a fantastic case center. So I I'm saying this because I think that sometimes in many academic conference, we don't talk enough about case writing and case teaching. So I want to you know, tell you that, that there, is, there is a place for, for this pedagogy. But let me tell you how I got started using cases, right? This was me lecturing and it actually happened with one, one unit that we have about the choice of legal structure by social entrepreneur. And this is how I felt my students were reacting to me telling them, oh, did you have something called solo entrepreneurs, LLC, uh, C Corps. I'm a lawyer by training. So all of these get me really excited, but I could tell my students were either falling asleep or some of them defaulted to some sort of checking their, their, their phones, right? So I just started to fit, you know, think, what do I have in my, what I call my teaching toolkit? So I can bring this boring concept, not boring for me, but very important uh, to the students. And of course, we all know about this HIP, um, the high impact practices, and we just discussed a very effective one with experiential learning. We, I use simulation in my classes. My, I also have learning uh, communities. I run Capstone. I run a study abroad courses. Uh, and of course, research base and internship. Now we have paid internship in my university. But in this, again, toolkit, I, I came to the case method and some authors actually call it like low fidelity simulation because the students are exposed to a real situation. And this is what is start to happen. I wrote a case that I haven't published yet on uh, choice of legal structures. And this is how I felt the students are starting to engage uh, with the content. Okay, so let's define now what I understand by a teaching case, because 
I, again, being part of the NACA community, we have a strong definition of what is a case. So it is a detailed narrative of a real issue or dilemma. You might find cases that are actually fictional, but I, I highly encourage you to think of using cases that are based on real organizations. They could be based on field-based, so you collect primary data, or there are wonderful cases that are just based on secondary sources. Of course, the traditional, and I got uh, my MBA in 2000, 2000, that's 21 years ago, and we use a lot of the traditional 30 pages Harvard cases, right? There is a trend toward shorter cases and some uh, publishers are launching this idea of the micro cases. And we're literally talking about one or two pages, almost like a critical incident um, case. And in two, two pages, they have the setting and the context to discuss the problem. I also wanna make it clear, um, most of the publishers require this second element, but we are talking about two pieces on the puzzle. We have the case study, which is what our students are going to read. But if you ask me, I'm in love with writing teaching notes because I put it there. That's where I think the rubber meets the road. A case study structure tend to have um, the five W's as part of the opening hook. What I mean by five W's is, do I read a couple of paragraphs and I'm very clear of who is the company, who is the protagonist, where did the action take place, what time in history, and, and why is this case important, right? What is that dilemma? So we call that the opening hook, and then you go into understanding the background, background of the entrepreneur, background uh, of the uh, industry, um, and then you get into the story time. You know, the, the protagonist might be dealing with different stakeholders, so you add quotations, and then eventually you get to the end of the case and almost think like full circle. You come back to the opening hook and you present that protagonist facing with that dilemma with certain sense of urgency. And that's the case. On the teaching note, and I say I, I'm very passionate about teaching note, is where you are actually going to help faculty to understand what that case can help the students to achieve. What are the learning objectives? Is it for a graduate course or an undergrad? Where in the design of those courses you see this case at the beginning of the course or later in the course because there's a minimum knowledge that the students need? Of course, you discuss your teaching plan. Uh, and I will talk briefly about online teaching. Um, the theoretical linkage, I wanna bring your attention to that one because a story, especially with the type of cases you think about B Corp or social impact, there are amazing stories. We always connect with these entrepreneurs and we say, we want this story to be told. But it, it's really about what theories, what frameworks are going to help my students to understand this problem that the entrepreneur was facing or the manager of that organization. So this is where um, I'll talk a little bit later about writing, but you might end up doing a case uh, teaching uh, writing effort and you might discover that you are unveiling something that the literature doesn't allow you to explain. So you might have a, a case research in a publication and a case teaching that develop at the same time. Of course, the discussion questions, how the students are going to be you know, engaging with, with the case and the epilogue. And of course, it goes without saying the students should never see the teaching note, okay? And, and um, because again, those, those are our secret tools. Um, what the literature is telling us in terms of the efficiency of the case method, and I put uh, a few of the articles, I just uh, submit a, um, a chapter in a book. So we did a lot of you know, uh, uh, research to understand the efficiency and what the literature is telling us about how, how useful the cases are, and is the, basically the idea that it does strain the understanding of those core concepts, because they can apply not only to the situation at hand, but the idea is that they get knowledge that is transferable to other uh, situations that they might encounter. This criticism of a lot of the things that we do as academics, like we don't live in the real world, well, with cases, we bridge the gap between theory and practice. And hopefully we are building what we call higher order thinking skills. If you think of uh, the traditional Bloom taxonomy, we want them to get to higher levels of, of knowledge, uh, not just to stay in understanding or description. It helps it to do um, 
to make sense of the reality that they're learning through those organizations. And if you believe in social constructivism, of course, they are creating knowledge as, as they evolve um, and, and the discussion take place. So when I think of actually teaching cases, this is the image, as I said, my MBA was, you know, heavy, heavy user of cases, um, but this is the traditional Harvard uh, setting, right? And I, I kind of challenge that, and this is how I see myself in my case discussions, uh, almost like a mimic. And what I learned over time is that the, the less I talk, the better for the case. And there are magic moments in case discussions where you're actually just moving your hands and facilitating that conversation. So I, I learned this from one of my, my mentors, when you are discussing a case and, and being facilitating that, you have to learn to ask, not to tell. And that's when the magic happens in, in case discussions. So I also tend to see case teaching as a process. So I break it down into, I mean, the obvious uh, stages. You have to do pre-work, you have to run the discussion, and then you have to um, do a debrief and, and do something after the discussion. And I wanna show you this from the instructor perspective. What do we do before we tackle a case? And then what do we want the students to do? And again, this will be a whole hour just to explain that. So I'm going to be very, very quick, but the idea is to get some thoughts of what happened in each of those uh, check marks, okay? Um, this is a lot of information. I condense four or five hours of different workshops that I do in like 45 minutes. So just bear with me. I hope you, you know, you fasten your seat belts. So instructor free work. This is about the selection of the case, right? Is what do I want the students to get out of these learning units? That's therefore, what is the case that better fit those goals? And I say this idea of build, know your students. I, I like to think I'm a marketer too. So I think of that as student persona, because when you select your case, you want the student to connect with the protagonist, right? So my students, for instance, are 60% um, Hispanic. I, I teach uh, in a Hispanic survey institution. So we have to make an effort as instructors to select protagonists that that the students can see themselves reflected. I also think about the positioning in the course and of course the delivery method. Am I going to be discussing this case online or I'm going to be discussing face-to-face? -face? And if it's online, synchronous or asynchronous? So a lot of thinking in that pre-work. Now on the student side, I have the case, I assign the case, what do I do to be sure that when the students walk in the class that could be online or face-to-face, -face, they are ready for that discussion? And of course, you have to read the case, right? But just raise your hands if you feel that all your students read everything that you are assigned. And again, especially knowing that there are wonderful cases that are 30 pages, right? And, and I already said that we are seeing really uh, from a journal perspective cases that are shorter are shorter. So now a lot of journals are talking about just nine to 10 pages. Um, so you wanna be sure they read. So I do a couple of things. I ask them to do a write-up and the write-up could be individual write-up or it could be in teams or it could be in pairs. And I usually, especially at the beginning, that's where I talk an scaffolding approach. I work with undergrads that they have never discussed cases. So my first case, all I wanna be sure in this write-up is that they read the case and they understand those five Ws that I already mentioned. Um, as we go through the semester, I say, okay, you understand what's going on in the case, what are the different options, right? We talk about decision-based cases. So do I do A or B? What are the pros and cons of each one? And eventually I ask them, what is your recommendation? And I create some templates where, again, for those recommendations, it's just an empty table, but I say option one, option two, option three, pros and cons. Very simple, but again, very effective with undergrad. Um, so they hopefully come to class for discussion time and they are prepared. And there are a few things that are obvious, but it's not the first time that I started a, a case discussion. I mean, that was 18 months ago, face to face, but I get my market and doesn't work, right? So I always encourage faculty to know your space, what type of class are you going to be using? Can you walk through the table? So you only have a few aisles. Again, your markers are working. How is the light? 
uh, do you have a microphone if it's a big room? Um, and I want to emphasize the issue of the time management. When I'm teaching a new space, a case, I always look for a clock because you are handling like in any teaching, right? Experience, even if you are lecturing, but you are delivering the content at the same time that you are you know, controlling the process. So knowing where you are in time, like now I'm, I'm checking the time for my talk, it is a very important. So a clock is very hand, uh, handy. You want to start strong and we, we use this idea of the icebreaker or a warm up open-ended question. So there is no right or wrong answer and everyone should be comfortable if they have read the case to have some sort of opinion. I already mentioned this learn to ask, not to tell because as I see my evolution as a, as a case teacher, I think I'm talking, as I said, less and less, and I control the discussion in a different way that I couldn't do at the beginning. So I, I encourage you to a lot of our practice, but know that you don't have to dominate the, the conversation. And there are a few things that I've been doing offline and online, but this idea of the role play, right? There might be a decision maker, but you want to assign um, different stakeholders perspective. Okay, we have a case with the introduction of a breakfast menu on Taco Bell. So I end up creating uh, different people in the board. Uh, so we have representative of the franchisees and we have representative obviously on the investors and we have representative of um, the marketing department. So that gives the students an opportunity to have to find arguments for positions that they might not even agree upon, okay? And parent share is also very helpful. So you tell them to do something just with one person before you come into the main uh, room. And in the, at the end, um, you, you wanna bring it home to avoid what I call the so what, because I mentioned this, you want a case to help the students to understand how their specific situation and the solution that the manager or entrepreneur use can be, generalized to similar situations. So I do a lot of, again, balancing, and I, I try again to describe my path as a case teacher. So I end up coming out with this different, um, it's a map, right, with two, two variables. How easy is the content? Because I'm very familiar with the company, the theoretical linkage, and then the challenge in the contest is if it's online versus face-to-face, -face, if you have a choice, obviously, but as a beginner case teacher, you wanna stay in this quadrant, right? You wanna be sure, again, my contest is on the easy side and I pick cases that I am comfortable with. And eventually you will move to that quadrant, but this is the key point that there is no straight line. You're going to be having some cases where you feel like, wow, this went really well and you collect feedback from the students and you felt that you were a very effective, um, case teacher, and then the next week, you don't know why, same class, same instructor, and things don't go so well. So there is a lot of reflection and back and forth at how you can get better. So I always like to bring this, you know, beautiful quote from uh, Professor Christensen. I, I just added to that, that it's not only the art of managing uncertainty, because you don't know what's going to happen in a class when you walk in to discuss a case, but it's also a balancing art. Okay, it's almost like you're juggling many, many, many elements. So what happened in what I call the post discussion? Again, I'm, I'm walking you very fast through the pre, during, and after. So from the student perspective, you, I ask them sometimes to do some sort of, you know, reflection on the journal so they can have a summary. Some cases might have a hangout, a handout, not hangout, handout that you give them to them so there is a further analysis. And I always have this case uh, feedback where basically with a Google form, I ask my students, of course, the case feedback address other things in the course, but basically I ask them about the specific case, right? In this case, this was in March. So I have discussed it to um, Honey uh, Homegrown and a sensory marketing case. So I just tell them like, did you like this case? Did you like the experience? And that way next semester, I can figure out if it's worth it to, to keep using those cases. And of course, as an instructor, we are always doing a lot of self-reflection, um, but we need to assess what we saw in the class. So I do have for the write-up uh, a rubric. I mean, I'm going to show you an example, but of course you do whatever it is 
you know, uh, that you want the students to, to know better. And then with participation, I try, I, I take notes, which is, you know, a little bit hard when you are walking, but it's the, the idea of quality versus quantity. And something I did this semester for the first time on the chat was an analysis. I download the chat of the Zoom room um, after we have a case discussion and I do a kind of analysis of frequency and what students are speaking the most or what type of um, comments they are doing. And again, that goes because I, I have this conversation with a few case teachers. If you try to reproduce online what you have been doing face-to-face, -face, that's a recipe for disaster. You don't want in a Zoom room like this to have two, three students that are dominated the whole conversation. So I use a, what I call strategic use of the chat. And I use and I encourage the students to use the chat. I do something like chat storm, I call it, and I'm happy to talk about all these, but that's a lot of rich data to perform the assessment. Let me quickly show you the, um, the rubric. So of course you want the student to understand what is the issue and, and how they, they do an analysis of those issues. This is the harder for undergrads for sure to actually take a, a position on the case and make a recommendation is very tough for them. How do they bring concepts for the course into the analysis? And of course with undergrads, I still have to do a lot of work on the writing mechanics, but I'm happy I'm sharing the slides so you can use obviously these. One quick note, again, online case discussions will be another two or three hours, but I wanna say, and you all have this experience already, preparation time, multiply everything by three. And then what you can actually achieve in a, usually I do 90 minute discussion face-to-face, -face, I divide my goals by two because you really achieve fewer, I mean, fewer learning goals in just one online session at the same time, okay? Uh, when it comes to the technology, I also, I see some colleagues that get really excited about the tools. And I say technology is your friend, but just you know one step at a time, because if you try to incorporate many, it, it could be very, very challenging. So a couple of suggestions for asynchronous discussions. I use VoiceThread to stay away from board discussions. I found those a little bit boring because we end up telling the students, just make one comment and then reply to two, right? And the students again end up saying, very good comment to their own colleagues. So it's, kind of hard to engage in a conversation that is meaningful. So I kind of default now to a tool called VoiceThread where the students have a piece uh, of media and it could be just a picture and then they have voice conversation over. So they, that is still talking to each other even if it's asynchronous. And then I already mentioned, I'll, I'll share that blog post and how I use the chat for discussions uh, in synchronous time. Um, of course, we talk, don't get me wrong, but I I found that the chat gives a voice to many students that are shy and in discussions in face-to-face, -face, they tend to really not talk. And out of, they, they bloom, even the discussion we've been having in the chat has been fascinating again without interrupting, interrupting the speaker. So I really encourage you to think um, how you can incorporate chat uh, in your case discussions. So I wanna go back to the idea of case selection, also to put in front of you sources of B Corp cases. When I first started looking for cases and writing, I was so confused about all the publishers, right? I didn't understand the difference between a journal versus a case collection and what is the role of Harvard as a distributor or even the case center. So this is a way I structure, again, my, my mind to find cases. I, we have what we call peer review academic journals, and those can be generalist and North America Case Research Association publish really good um, cases. And there are some social impact related cases. And then we have the case association too that have the case journal. But you can also say, okay, because my case is, is a big corp case, but I want it to be in a focus um, journal. We have entrepreneurship education and pedagogy. That's one of the places where I have published. 
And we have, I already mentioned, um, the case, the wine research uh, journal that uh, Sonoma State put together. So again, they also publish social impact cases. But apart from the journals, you have what I call the generalist case collection. Emerald has an emerging market case collection with a lot of social impact related cases. Of course, Ivy, of course, Harvard, and the Case Center, which is a nonprofit based on the UK. And because without saying for all of these, if you are an educator, you can get free access to both the case and the notes. But thinking about how much my students can uh, spend on, on, um, on class resources, I end up looking for a lot of what I call open sources. So these are free cases. And I found these three Oikos, which Actually, they give an annual award. So those cases are always really, really good. And then the Journal of Case Research and Inquire, that's also free uh, for the students. And then this Canadian university has put together CaseNet, and these are multimedia cases. So you will have videos uh, and interviews with the manager or the decision maker. And then uh, we also have Sage business cases. It's a general collection, but I'm the editor of yes and narrow uh, case collection that we call social impact so we have published a few B Corp cases and again this is just a quick overview to give you the understanding of where you can find uh, B Corp cases we're going to i'll give you a few examples but social impact related cases in general so connecting with this idea or this need that i have when i first start teaching and getting into cases is, okay, how do I find the ones, you know, again, that relevant for the classes that we teach. So, as I said, be academic and social chain innovator. A few of you probably know uh, Debbie Brock. So she's behind this amazing website full of resources. We, we have partnered um, and joined forces to try to create a repository of social impact related cases. So, I'm going to be sharing later the link. So I'm going to, of course, when this is ready, this will be part of the resources for our members. And I want to invite people right now. We've been doing all this um, tabulation manually. It has been a lot of work, but I invite everyone that has published the case. So if you have a favorite case to put it out there uh, in the link that I will share later. Summer, I'm, I'm getting there. I see a lot of message. I'll. I'll get to the chat in a minute. Let me just show quickly, I'm almost at the end, a few specific cases. And one consideration about the B Corp uh, cases, you can think about two ways. My students don't know much about B Corp, so I want a case that deal with B Corp, but explain the students what is the certification, who is VLAB, what is the B impact assessment, how the decision process, right? And that's an example is coding autism. I wrote that case and it was uh, actually a pending B Corp certification at that point because it was a new company. But you might say, you know what? My students already know what a B Corp case is. So you can look into cases that are still deal with B Corp, but the dilemma of the decision point is a different one. And I give you an example. The refill shop is a B Corp in Ventura, very next, I mean, very close to Patagonia. And actually they are a B Corp and we highlight that in the case, but the decision point was really about the scaling. So we discussed different scaling strategies for um, social enterprises. So that's a distinction I wanted to do. You can also look into B Corp cases that are again, a small or medium sized business and I put some of the originals, I mean, original, the early ones, West Paul, Poppy Barley, MVI. Um, Ros Rosanna, you're still here. That's your case. Uh, Rosanna Garcia, All Birds. And then you could say, no, I really want to expose my students to publicly trade B Corps, right? We have now, I, uh, I don't know, it's like 10 already um, certified B Corps that are publicly trade, but there is an interesting case uh, about Etsy, and I assume everyone know the, the story of Etsy, how they will now be able to actually amend their um, legal structure and become a benefit corporation. So they eventually drop the, the B Corp certification in contrast with a laureate university because they were already a benefit corporation when they went 
into an IPO. So these are cases, B Corp cases that I will not discuss with my undergrads at the beginning of the semester, but they are more appropriate toward the end of the semester or MBA students. There is also a case for Danon, Tracy Claus. Um, shout out to um, our colleagues in, in the board, uh, Bero Casarin, Be sorry, Bero, I'm changing your last name, Devenin. She wrote this about um, Finstark in Chile. And then we have a couple of cases, Guayaki and Veritas. And it's very interesting. I was talking to Vero about this. What happened is in, we went to Harvard and we say, okay, B Corp cases. If the authors don't say the publisher in the keywords or in the synopsis that you are you know, uh, dealing with a case that is a B Corp, they're not going to come out in the search. So we end up finding these two that again are obviously B Corp, but they are not declared as such in these uh, publisher websites, okay? So those are some of the ones that you can bring you know, into your classes. Just one quick comment uh, on case writing. Again, today wasn't about the writing piece, but I hope again, because you're dealing with amazing organizations that you feel you know, compelled or encouraged to write. So triggers of a case obviously is a chat with practitioners, you bring a guest speaker into class, you read something on the news, Sometimes I have seen a Twitter and say, hmm, there is something here. Or like I said at the beginning, you are teaching something in your class that is very boring if you only lecture. So you, you have your own gap in your course design that really require a teaching case that you can find uh, already published. So just a few questions to ask yourself, what type of case, as I said, primary or secondary sources, um, real organization of fictitious, and if it's a real organization, do I have access? It's realistic to think that this company is going to spend time with me, you know, discussing and, and sharing, you know, the situation. What are my five W's? Again, I'm, I think it was yesterday, I got an email from a colleague and he know this organization and they want to write a case. And I said, what is the case about, right? What are going to be the dilemma, the learning objectives. Um, and if not, you know, have a longer conversation with the organization. Sometimes what I have noticed, the companies think, oh, they're going to be writing a PR article. And I always make it very clear. This is not, I mean, to make you look good, right? Otherwise I will be accused by the reviewers that I'm editorializing my writing. So you need to let them know this is not a PR and we're going to present you with doubts. My, my entrepreneur in the refill shop, after I sent her the case for her approval, she was very uncomfortable. She's like, I look like I have doubts. And I'm like, you are an entrepreneur. And of course you don't know how you wanna scale, right? Otherwise life will be very easy. So just be sure you address these questions from the beginning. Of course, you wanna know if there is a gap in existing cases, please don't write a case to tell the students just how to do a SWOT analysis, right? There are so many of those cases, just you know, challenge yourself to find something to write that, you know, again, fill a gap that is not already there. Um, I already mentioned, please think of those learning objectives at front, theoretical linkage, and a boy, I call the feel good story trap, because again, sometimes, you fall in love with the organization, you wanna tell the story, but you are not able to anchor that into you know, a theoretical linkage and, and learning objectives. Uh, for those of you that are interested in the wanna learn more, those are two fantastic books. Um, I particularly like this one because it actually have worksheets that are very helpful for people that start to write a case for the first time. I do have uh, a course, it's a capstone for undergrads where my students write cases um, and I supervise them and actually they, they publish the cases. So I find this fantastic IV publishing resource to help you design that course. And I'm happy to share as much information as possible. So I'm just wrapping up by inviting you to find your case drive. There is amazing, super supportive, uh, community out there, NACRA will be online in October. As I said, if you have a case and you still wanna send it to the conference, I'm the track chair, so don't tell anyone, but I can receive your case on my end. Um, and of course, please check the Case Research Foundation for those 
a PhD students and junior scholars because you know you could be joining us live in NACRA 22 uh, thanks to this fellowship. This is my info. I will share the couple of links now as I stop talking. And I am confident that we have at least 10 minutes, right? If I'm looking at my clock on the what? 10 minutes for some questions and some discussion. You want me to go through the chat and, and see? I need to go back up, up. Well, Maria, I'll I'll repeat my question um, yes, that I please. mentioned in the okay. chat. Can you actually talk to us a little bit about your chat management techniques for a, a case discussion? Yes. So you know how Zoom, a couple of ideas, Zoom have these reactions and emojis. So that's one of the things that I ask questions and I ask the students to answer through those emojis and reactions, um, especially with the yes, no, that helped me to do quick polls. Like, will you do A versus B? And the Zoom will hold the number of yes or no. Um, a second thing I do, I have this technique where I show the students, if you are going to ask me a question, it's very handy if you put in front the word hashtag question, because as I look at the chat, I know you are asking me a question, right? Um, I also do the chat storm. I will ask a question that relates to the case. Um, it has to be a simple answer, right? Oh, and I said, write it, type it, but hold, don't press intro. And then I do a three, two, one, and then the students answer at the same time. And that's actually a great technique to avoid cold calling because then I can say, oh, Emily, thank you. You say, amazing, Maria, can you please elaborate on that? So. It gives the students an opportunity to think about your question and have an answer formulated, but you know, it also again it helps you to to I call it a warm call um, on the chat. Um, what else? So that's what I call a storm chat, the questions. And I will say again, I will share, I wrote a blog post with some ideas. And this morning I was in another. Uh, conference. It was just one hour, and I asked if someone has written something about the strategic use of chat for engagement, and I can't find anything. So if anyone has anything related, because I think we we tend to try to reproduce, again, in case discussion, what we have been doing in the class, and that's just not working, because two or three students dominate the whole uh, discussion. So I, I wanna you know, figure out how to use the chat more strategically. Yes, please, Jordan, thank you. Thank you. Is there any other questions? And I see a few cases. Ooh, thank you, Mayor. Yes, absolutely. I didn't get into that, but I found breakout rooms to have been to have been one of the most helpful things in case discussions. I also use not only the breakout rooms, but I use Google, uh, it could be a Jamboard or Google um, slides just to have some accountability of what's going on in that room. So the students obviously are left with a question and sometimes they go to the room and they're like, what do we have to do now? So if you say, okay, you come out with that room in 10 minutes and this is, you know, what I want to see in those slides, that helps to keep the students accountable. Um, I didn't share this because, again, that was a little bit too much, but in, in my chapter, we actually putting together this list of resources for online discussions, and we divide it in synchronous versus asynchronous. So as you get these slides, you're going to be some of the things that we, or I've been using successfully um, in the last 14 months now. And in fact, you're going to experience Paddle. Uh, for those of you that may have not used Paddle, it is also a very effective um, online tool. I mean, it's on the cloud for, for online case discussions. So yes, Susan, ab absolutely, they're critical. Otherwise, a whole 90 minutes, just the way we are doing this, it will be a nightmare for students. So you want to give them one question. I mean, Harvard. Um, teachers talk about the pastures, right? So they, you engage them for 10 minutes, they come back to the room, another question, you send them back to the room. So you, you wanna manage that. More questions, comments? 
who is writing a case soon, who wants to submit a case to NACRA even if we close. <laughs> Maria, it looks like there's a, a question from Mark. Could you maybe talk a little bit more about next steps for the, um, the compilation of cases that you're putting together and how that'll be shared? Yeah, so the link obviously to the form, I can share that uh, right now if I come out of sharing so I can see my, my notes. And then the idea is when we feel confidence that we have most of the, especially the B Corp cases that we wanna be in, um, in this repository, we will connect it through our in our membership site. So it will be on the membership. Um, you know, those of you that are members, the part obviously that you can see as member. So that's the plan. And of course, if you are submitting something and say, Maria, I really miss this field, because we it is a little bit tricky because if we make it very comprehensive, then we will die in the effort. So we want to keep it simple. Someone was asking me, why don't we have like the case research journal, the volume, and we are just keeping the year, right? We're not going to those details just to keep it a little bit simple, but uh, it is an ongoing project. So please feedback is, is more than welcome. So let me uh, quickly come out of and stop sharing if that's okay. So I can share the link very quick to the form. So I'm hoping, um, 15, 20 days that we have the uh, full spreadsheet available for, for all our members. Uh, hopefully that won't work. So that's the form to input your cases or your favorite cases. If there is something that you love, even if you are not the, the author, we welcome that. I think we went over time, but we're good. <laughs> Okay, You're no more questions. Perfectly timed, Maria. Good, good. I've been looking at my clock on the, the wall. Thank you, Luis. Thank you, Jill.